Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar organized by the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. My name is Ruzbe Parsi. I head the Middle East and North Africa program, and we are organizing this webinar together with our colleagues at the Global Politics and Security program. In 2021, we organized uh, three webinars on the phenomenon of religion in international politics. And using that as a, both a format, but also looking at these complicated phenomenon and their concept underlying them, we decided that in 2022, we would tackle something even more tricky to grasp, populism. What is populism? both as a concept, or more importantly, as a political practice, who is a populist? And how, insofar that it's possible, can we even try and define what populism is? This is the first of three webinars where we're going to try and look at the connection between domestic politics, populism in domestic politics, and the way they uh, manifest themselves in the foreign policy of those countries. And for this first webinar, we have tried to be somewhat timely by choosing two countries that recently have had elections, France and Hungary. And we will get back to them uh, in a moment. But in order to try and at least give some rudimentary understanding of what populism could be, uh, we also have invited a scholar who works specifically on populism as a phenomenon. So the three distinguished panelists who are going to help us try and understand all of this are in order of their presentations, uh, Dr. Paolo Graziano, who works at Padua University, uh, who has written, among other things, uh, co-edited a book on varieties of populism in Europe in times of crisis, uh, and also written a book on neo-populism. Unfortunately, as far as we know so far, only in Italian, uh, but that's, the title itself also indicates that the notion of populism is evolving. Then this will be followed by our panelist, Alice Petrian, a longtime veteran of Swedish journalism, radio journalism in particular, who's worked as a foreign correspondent for many years and is the author of Made in France, Pride and Nationalism, that analyzes the rising, rising nationalism in France. Last but not least, Gabor Halmai, who is at the European University Institute, uh, who's worked on comparative constitutional law, international human rights, also worked as an advisor to the president of the Hungarian Constitutional Court. And one of your latest publications is Populism or Authoritarianism, a plaidoyer against illiberal or authoritarian constitutionalism, which of course is of particular interest because how one writes a law or practices law is very important for what kind of societal parameters uh, we are looking at. So, uh, with no further ado, let's tackle the very nature of the beast, as it were, populism. What is it? Uh, what is it not? Perhaps sometimes an easier thing to answer. Uh, and what constitutes populism in practice, rather than just in a generic definition? In order to help us do this, Paolo, I'm turning to you. Uh, could you help us try and disentangle, to some degree at least, what this concept means. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to uh, discuss uh, these topics with uh, distinguished scholars and colleagues. So uh, I will uh, very briefly try to uh, introduce uh, uh, the, the concept and uh, try to see how uh, the concept has been translated into political reality. So first of all, uh, one of the uh, most uh, shared definitions of populism is uh, focusing on the ideology and therefore the first element that has been used in the literature regarded the thin centered nature of the ideology of populism. With this respect, we do mean that at the heart of the populist ideology, we have a limited number uh, of elements uh, which make uh, the ideology rather thin. Uh, not only it's thin in terms of the elements, but it's also thin in terms of uh, the possible changes of these elements that may uh, be uh, somehow uh, interchangeable uh, in function of the preferences of the populist leader. 
let me just name uh, one author that is Ernesto Laclau, who uh, has worked extensively on uh, the notion of uh, populism uh, in terms uh, of uh, looking at uh, the uh, people and populism as, uh, as such as an empty signifier. So first element, the thin-centered ideology uh, is uh, at the heart of populism. Uh, the second key element regards the communication style. Some scholars have focused on the extremely uh, uh, um, linear uh, communication style, which starts from uh, the acknowledgement of the existence uh, of a given critical situation. Uh, the second step is acknowledging the need, the necessity, the urgency of doing something. And the third step, the final step, is uh, somehow uh, the leader saying that he or she is there exactly to solve the, the problem. So it's a very linear, very simple communication style that starts from the crisis, moves to the need to do something, and to the fact that there is a leader, populist leader, that is able to do what's needed in order to uh, save the situation. A uh, third and final element uh, that has been used in defining populism uh, is populism seen as a, a, a political strategy, uh, focusing on the leadership elements and the leadership capacities of those who are supporting populist policies. So the idea is that at the heart of populist movements and populist parties, uh, the political strategy in the hands of the leader is to personalize the message personalize the activity in order to have the leader in front of everything else. So on the one hand, uh, a limited number of ideolo uh, ideological elements. On the uh, other hand, we have a communication style and uh, a political strategy. Uh, another element that has to be considered is that uh, we should uh, uh, speak about uh, uh, neo-populisms. Now, one uh, a very brief uh, explanation of the reason why I talk about neo-populism and neo-populisms. Uh, first, why uh, do I uh, underline the need to uh, talk about neo-populism? Uh, because uh, we know that populism is a phenomenon rooted in history uh, and it goes back uh, to uh, the second half of the 19th century. Uh, my take, which is shared by a number of scholars, is that we should differentiate contemporary forms of this from uh, more classic forms of the phenomenon. So uh, neo-populism is what uh, we should be using in order to differentiate it from uh, the phenomenon that was there uh, over a century ago. Uh, why should we do this? Because uh, over a century ago, we had very different economic, political, and social conditions. Uh, in the past 50 years, instead, we had uh, a growing uh, phenomenon which covered first Latin America, then growingly uh, Europe and the rest of the world, where neo-populist leaders, uh, again, were uh, using uh, the thin ideology, a specific communication uh, uh, style, and a political strategy. So this uh, is a way to somehow uh, delimit uh, the, uh, um, and circumscribe somehow the phenomena that we're focusing on. Second point, why the plural? Neo-populisms, uh, because we may not only have uh, different forms uh, of leadership, but we may also have different uh, elements that are underlined by the thin-centered ideology. So with this respect, we don't have time to go into the details of the literature, but we have exclusionary variants and inclusionary variants of neo-populism. The exclusionary variants, for example, Marine Le Pen in France or Orban in Hungary, that limit the notion of people to uh, the natives, uh, to those who are uh, uh, um, carriers of national identities uh, that have been there for uh, decades, if not longer. Whereas on the other hand, we may have inclusionary uh, neo-populists such as Mélenchon uh, to uh, remain in France and uh, Podemos to a certain extent or Syriza uh, in uh, Spain and Greece that are uh, expanding the notion of people in order to also include uh, some of those that actually happen to be in a given territory without uh, having a, a nationality of the territory or uh, being uh, natives of the territory itself. So 
uh, in the empirical manifestations going towards the end of my first uh, intervention, uh, in the empirical manifestations of neopopulism, uh, not only do we find different uh, people, of course, so we have, uh, for example, Mélenchon, uh, Iglesias, Le Pen, uh, and, and others, but we also have a different focuses. Let me give you one example. Uh, we may have welfare chauvinism supported by a number of uh, uh, neo-populist leaders, meaning that welfare should target first nationals, first the natives. Uh, the slogan, America first, or Italy or Italians first, uh, I think, uh, 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 underlines this aspect very clearly. On the other hand, you may have uh, welfare uh, in a much more universalistic uh, reading, which means that uh, welfare entitlements should be provided also to those who are not nationals of a given country uh, and do not uh, uh, um, belong uh, in uh, identity terms to uh, a given territory. So once again, providing some examples in the municipalities of Madrid and of Barcelona, we had some attempts to expand welfare provision also to those uh, actors, to those individuals, to those uh, people that uh, were not uh, natives or were not nationals of uh, the country uh, where the cities uh, uh, were. So to conclude, um, the uh, debate over the definition is much more complex than uh, how uh, I tried to portray it. Uh, I tried somehow to really uh, uh, use uh, the most standard and shared elements of uh, the definitions. Um, but I particularly wanted to underline the fact that in reality, uh, the empirical manifestations of neo-populism are uh, diversified and diverse. So when we're uh, trying to understand uh, um, neo-populism, of course, we may take a normative approach, but my uh, take and my suggestion would be, first of all, to uh, take an analytical perspective in order to distinguish the various phenomena and then ask ourselves, what may be the impact of the different phenomena on uh, the uh, political or policy elements that we are interested in. Thank you, Paolo. Um, so let me just see if I, if I understood correctly. To some degree, we are talking about difference of form and content or method and structure, as in how they pursue a particular set of policies and then what those policies contain. What does it actually consist of? And there the ideology is rather thin in the sense that there isn't much to grasp that would stick out or would be very particular. Uh, and then it becomes a question of how they are conceiving and disseminating this. And the populists, irrespective of whether left or right, can share those traits in terms of how they convey and go about it. But ideologically or content-wise, they would be somewhat different than exclusionary, inclusionary, other ways of trying to understand it. Now, obviously, to some degree, exclusion and, and um, exclusion is not just about who belongs in terms of heritage, but it is also elite versus supposedly the common man. Uh, sometimes it's put in terms of countryside versus city, uh, that's always, of course, contextual. But would you agree that those are some other axes that one can use to try and, and kind of pinpoint the variations uh, that you are mentioning? Sure, let me, let me just add that the thin center ideology uh, clearly is uh, um, uh, linked to the uh, antagonistic relationship between the people and the elites. Uh, I, I took this uh, for granted in the sense that there's a clear enemy there and these are the elites, but the elites, again, may change change uh, very uh, substantially from uh, country to country, from leader to leader, from neo-populism to neo-populism. So uh, the, uh, not only elites change, but also the people change, as, as we learned. So the definition of the people that Mélenchon provides is quite different from the definition of the people that Le Pen provides. With this respect, in the simplified uh, ideology of neo-populism, you have the empty signifier, to use Laclau's words, that is, uh, uh, um, um, uh, nurtured, uh, and therefore it makes sense. It is becomes uh, uh, something that uh, is uh, makes sense uh, to the various political parties in different ways. So on the one hand, the people uh, changes, but also the lead change. The main shared feature of neo-populist 
movements or parties is that they simplify the political reality into them and us, the elites and the people, defending the people against the elites. But the definitions of the elites and the people vary substantially. Very good. Thank you. Um, and that, of course, nicely brings us to our first, not test case, but our first case study, uh, which is France. At least, uh, I don't think anyone has managed to, to escape the fact that there were presidential elections in France uh, quite recently. And of course, the interesting thing is that it seems to be the same main battle line, if you will, uh, between one candidate that is the representative of what is called the Republican Front, everyone who doesn't want the far right to win an election, and a far right candidate. Now, we also had two candidates in the first round both Zemmour and Le Pen. So when we look at France, we talk about Macron sometimes as a centrist, but I think that would be dependent on which issue we are looking at and at what time, because he has of course tacked both right and left in trying to maneuver both against Mélenchon and uh, Le Pen. Could you help us disentangle a bit all this maneuvering and, and where France mm -hmm. stands and more importantly, perhaps what the trajectory is because for each successive presidential election, Le Pen has increased her share of the voters. Uh, and, and that has, if you will, ramifications for the future. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm not a doctor in political science or I'm a journalist and economist in the beginning. So um, I, my perspectives are very often uh, economical. Um, never underestimate populism. I think that's a good lesson to learn from democratic elections in France over the time. Uh, the whole political landscape is completely transformed compared to what it looked like before 2017 and that year's presidential election. Emmanuel Macron made his entrance on the scene and his entrance transformed everything, but it was a transformation that was already underway for a very long time. Um, Le Pen was there before him, and the father Le Pen was there before him. And on the left side, there are also populists. France had before two big ruling parties, the socialists and the traditional conservatives, today named the, the, the Republicans. And they have switched power over the decades since de Gaulle. And, but suddenly they were out. Uh, 2017 was like a political big bang. And over the years, last years, it has only gotten worse for these two major parties. Um, now in April, in the presidential election, the, their two candidates only got less than 10% of the votes. Uh, to simplify, one third went to Macron, one third went to Le Pen, one third went to uh, the left-wing extremist or populist, or whatever you were calling him. Uh, Paolo, you called him a populist, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Uh, but then there is also fourth block, those who abstained, those who did not vote, who didn't find a candidate to vote on, or who does not believe any longer in the democratic system, actually. Um, they, um, uh, they didn't find any candidate to trust on, and do not trust maybe the system. So Macron uh, will be the president for another five years, but the bigger picture is that the electorate is open to forces that do not agree with institutions, don't agree to budget control, for example, do not agree to play with the siblings in the European family. Uh, both Le Pen and Mélenchon are very uh, skeptical to Brussels. Uh, you can wonder how this was possible. Uh, I would say for a very long time, many French voters had had the feeling that France is sliding down a slope with nothing stopping it and that the country is inevitably losing its grandeur. During the last 30 years, the manufacturing industry has re been reduced uh, very much in favor of the service sector. The service sector stands for 75% of the economy. Agriculture has also become smaller. I mean, French products, we all know French agriculture products, it's the pride in these products, uh, but also that sector is much smaller. So the message in a very Trump-like uh, style, I would say, like Mr. Trump, uh, from several of the candidates, both left and right has been French back to the French, France back to the French. 
enough is enough. And a lot of boaters have been listening to this, uh, that they can regain and be nostalgic. Uh, behind this is what Boris Johnson managed to exploit in the Brexit campaign, I would say, the question of control. Tan, traditional author authoritarian and nationalism, is a concept often connected to the political right. And yes, Le Pen is absolutely promoting a tan policy. No immigration, no Muslims, and as little Brussels and Europe as possible. A globalist is almost like a swear word to Marine, someone who destroys all opportunities for the French individuals. And um, she uses this classic divide. Macron is part of the elite, a president for the rich people, a representative for the establishment. And I, Marine Le Pen, I'm siding with the people with a big P. So she's really working on the classical divide. Immigration is an issue with create, which creates anxiety among many Europeans. We all know about that. Uh, it's get, uh, it gets connected to criminality, which leads to the next part in that chain, no control. Macron is open for a certain amount of immigration and does not close French borders, but many French voters like in Sweden are worried about instability in their neighborhood and in the streets and believe that those in power do not address this problem enough. In the case of France, Macron does not bring enough security is, is the impression. And the perception is often um, that the left-wing politicians so far have not tackled the tan issues to say so to say, enough. I think it, that goes for Sweden also. I think um, Swedish social democrats are tackling now very much tan issues. Uh, but in France, this feeling of lack of control is also connected to the purse, to the household's economical situation and to daily life issues like housing, for example. And um, as an economist, I would like to interpret populism uh, in something you said also, Paolo, that it is not only a divide between elite and power uh, people, but also an expression for when politicians promise more than they can deliver, and when they keep on adding promises that exceeds those from the competitor. Marine Le Pen made le pouvoir d'achat, the citizens' individual buying force, the big issue in this year's presidential election. The French economy is not doing that bad with a strong recovery after COVID and uh, unemployment figures lower than in decades, it looks fairly good. But positive macroeconomic figures do not trickle down in the eyes of Marine, uh, Serge, uh, Michel, whatever their names are. Um, they live in small towns or in the countryside, dependent on the car, and they insist that they have less and less in their wallet. So they tend to listen to Marine Le Pen's very caring tune, who says, if you vote on me, I will decide that you don't have to pay tax on gasoline and no tax on 100 staple food items. I will tax the rich people, but not you. And she goes on on economical issues. Because that's people feel that they don't have control over this. I'm not too sure about the English word for this, overbid, overcall, but in France you say in politique de surenchère, which is like you go on overbidding, overbidding, overbidding. And I think that's an economical term that's populist. The left winger Jean-Luc Mélenchon's proposals would end up with minus 66 billion euros, according to accounting done by newspaper Le Figaro. Marine Le Pen's budget would end up minus 29 billions, while Emmanuel Macron proposes a balanced budget. While the left politician Mélenchon is not proning no immigration, he still says not no to Europe and plays on economical arguments that uh, you, can, you, know, you can question them. Are they really realistic? I mean, his budget is really far out. Uh, for decades, French leaders have tried to reform the pension system, which is the big thing now in France, the pension system, and there is not enough money for it. Macron said in 2017 that it would be one of his big reforms, but the protest movement, yellow vests, caused the first dinner, and then came COVID, so it was stopped. He couldn't continue the, re, this reform, but he will. that will be one of his first reforms. And uh, the left winger Jean-Luc Mélenchon and right wing Marine Le Pen, they all both promise their uh, voters 
that they will lower, lower the retirement age to 60 years. Although already today, the average French person leaves 62 and a half, maybe 63 even. Uh, Macron has been saying 65 and he's lowering it to 64. Um, Marine Le Pen managed once again to come second in the first round of the presidential race and was this time closer behind Macron. In the second round, she was defeated. Um, she has she got still 42% of the votes. Bravo. She's, I mean, it was very strong of her and very encouraging for her. She managed to make her an ordinary politician. Uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon is more a union man, you could say. Um, so uh, he's more like a collective person and a different person. Uh, I think I have one reflection, not being a political science. And I wonder, because France is like a semi-presidential system. So is it sort of built in the, into the system that you have this president very high up and then you have the people. So you inevitably sort of come into uh, um, this populist situation. And also you can wonder if Macron is not the biggest populist among them all actually. Sorry, I was Alice, very- uh... No, 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 that's, that's very good. And actually that's a very good uh, uh, final point if you will, because that is in the end how we, we are in a sense ending up where we started, which is, are we defining populism based on content as in particular policies or are we basing them on our understanding of the simplicity of the solution that they're suggesting? So for instance, this idea of budget deficits, it's something that you can discuss in terms of, well, there are economic theories who say you can run a budget deficit. And there are those who claim you should absolutely not run a budget deficit. So these are questions that both have to do with the very premise of what you consider to be responsible politics uh, and how then you can responsibly uh, conduct politics. So based on what you've just said, what it seems to me is that there are no stable elements in French electoral politics anymore. Nothing. Uh, and Macron himself does not have a crown princess or prince. So the question is, what is the continuity in his own political movement? And if there is none, who is going to eat up his part of the cake, as it were? in five years when you have the next presidential elections. And just very briefly from you, would you do you foresee that the center that he claims to, to in a sense, hold, uh, that it can continue within the party form that he has, in the movement form? Uh, or will this disperse among several contenders? I think it would disperse. 49% voted. It for others than Macron and Le Pen. Uh, so I think it will disperse. And uh, there are already so many now uh, positioning themselves to actually take over. And he has great difficulties um, ahead of the, uh, the parliamentary election in June. So uh, I think he will have five very difficult years. He's, the slope is not downward for him. It's like really upward actually. Yes, and we will get back to that because that begs the question of cohabitation, something that French presidents have not had to do for a while now, uh, which is the question then is who is going to be uh, commanding parliament? If it's going to be exactly. Mélenchon or, or Le Pen uh, and how Macron then will tack this way or that way. But uh, let's let's uh, leave that for the next round. Thank you very Sorry, much. Sorry, so uh, overrunning. No, not at all. Time. No, not at all. Uh, Gabor, um, you... I hope are going to help us now try and understand the other case, which has uh, gotten a lot of attention lately in Europe for various reasons, which is Hungary. In the Hungarian case, it's parliamentary elections, so the, 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 it's a slightly more complicated system to, to try and understand than the, the president with just two candidates who can run against each other. Uh, but Hungary is one of those countries that for quite some time have been pushing the envelope, as it were, in terms of what you can do within the parameters of what would be recognized as democracy within the European Union. It has had its run-ins with the commission in Brussels, uh, just like Poland, for instance, also has. And these things, these positions also have ramifications for how Hungary orients itself in its foreign policy. 
Um, could you help us understand a bit where Hungary is now and what this very long tenure in power, uh, Fidesz and Prime Minister Viktor Orban has for the country? Yes, uh, let me start by thanking you for the kind invitation and also uh, starting with, with a disclaimer that I'm a constitutional scholar. So my main interest in the topic is mostly the relationship between populism and constitutionalism. But back to your question and back to, to the very definition of populism uh, in relation to the Hungarian case, uh, uh, in Paolo's uh, excellent uh, introduction, I would refer to the distinction between the uh, exclusionary and inclusionary version. So Hungary is certainly one of the exclusionary uh, versions. In other words, uh, other definitions call them authoritarian or non-authoritarian uh, populism. Uh, the Hungarian one is certainly an authoritarian uh, type of, of populism. Uh, I even used to, to, to refer to Isaiah Berlin's uh, definition of the so-called false populism. Uh, which means that, that there are certain populists who very much refer to the people uh, against the elite uh, in order to hide certain agenda. And this agenda is, is an authoritarian and autocratic agenda, uh, very much influenced by nationalism. So for instance, when, when Orban refers to the, to the to the enemies of the people, uh, he is not referring to the elite because he very much belongs to the elite. Uh, he is referring to the nation, a homogeneous nation. The first reference was uh, in 2002 when he lost the election after his first term uh, of governing between uh, uh, 98 and 2002. Uh, he said, the nation cannot be in opposition. In other words, he identified his own party and his own supporters with the nation. So this, this uh, kind of uh, dichotomy between the people and, and the elite is very much against uh, uh, the 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 nation meaning the 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 right wing conservative uh, uh, voters uh, and parties and everyone else. This is this is the very uh, exclusionary nature of of this kind of populism, which is on the other hand has almost no ideology whatsoever. Uh, which can be demonstrated by the fact that Fidesz and Viktor Orban started as a liberal uh, uh, politician and the party belonged to the liberal international uh, until they switched to the, to the conservative side, seeing that there is more space there for a political win uh, on the conservative side. So this is more, more or less rhetoric to hide the the autocratic uh, uh, pursuit to keep the power for any means. Uh, the next uh, definition of, of uh, uh, the kind of content of this regime uh, happened in his very famous speech held in 2014, uh, when he claimed that uh, Hungary introduces an illiberal democracy. Uh, as opposed to the liberal democratic systems all over uh, Europe and within the European Union, actually. The European Union is very much built on liberal uh, democracy. He refuted this kind of liberal democracy, saying that it's unsuccessful and named uh, uh, countries, successful illiberal uh, uh, states, I would not call them democracies because they are not democracies uh, at the end of the day. He named Turkey, uh, Russia, China, Singapore, uh, so countries which are 
character can be characterized mostly as autocracies. So this is the, the, the very nature of, of the system. And what is the content of this autocratic system? On the one hand, this is the total dismantlement of any checks and balances in the system openly. So the, the new constitution of Fidesz uh, introduced in 2011 does not contain any, any checks and balances towards the, the uh, uh, government's power. Uh, and Viktor Orban frank, uh, very, very uh, openly and frankly uh, 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 and proudly uh, announced that illiberal constitution as a way out from this, this unsuccessful uh, liberal trend uh, in, in Europe and within the European Union. Uh, the other characteristic is the, the lack of any guarantees of, of any fundamental rights. In other words, uh, uh, denying the liberal aspects of, of liberal democracy, the, 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 the human rights aspect of, of a liberal uh, democracy. There is no uh, freedom of the media. Uh, anymore uh, in the country. There is no freedom of religion anymore uh, in the country. There are no, no independent uh, institutions which would anyhow uh, oversight this kind of, of uh, uh, fundamental uh, rights uh, uh, provisions, he mostly held also in, in the, the new, new constitution. So, uh, in other words, this is a, a nationalistic, uh, autocratic system, which cannot be even considered, in my view, uh, as a democracy. The election on April the 3rd, uh, the very last election, parliamentary elections, which again uh, 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 resulted in a two-third majority uh, victory of of Fidesz uh, uh, government cannot be considered as democratic election. Uh, not only because there is no uh, free media, there is no, no uh, possibility for, for opposition parties to, to take part in, in the election campaign, or there is no possibility for the voters to be, to be uh, informed about the, the situation of the country. Uh, if I have one more minute, I can, can uh, say two examples, very, very uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, speaking examples of, of that. Hungary was one of the worst country uh, dealing with, with COVID. Uh, the highest uh, death rates in the world was in Hungary. Uh, uh, still, the Hungarian population, with this lack of, of information flow, uh, regarded uh, the treatment of the COVID uh, about 60% as, as satisfactory by the government. The other, other example is the war in Ukraine. So 67% of the Hungarian population thinks that this is a, a, a just war by, by Russia. And this is due to the propaganda, the one-sided propaganda of this Orban regime, which very much misuses this kind of one-sided uh, uh, playing field in, in the uh, uh, election campaign. That is why I, I, I claim that this wasn't a democratic election. Orban uh, could not be beaten uh, on this election which does not mean that the opposition uh, uh, did not commit any, any failures during the election campaign, but it was not possible to, to beat Orban uh, in the current circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've given us uh, quite a few new doors to open into this, this maze that we call both politics and, and populism. So let me try and pick up on a few of those and then we'll go around again to, to discuss where the connections are and where the differences are. Nationalism, I think, is crucial for understanding populism then, because to some degree it is about this idea of channeling the people's will. 
having defined the people in a very usually exclusionary way in nationalism. I mean, in the end, nationalism is about being able to differentiate yourself from someone else. Um, and at the same time, the interesting thing with nationalism and populism in this is that you can share all of those methods and all of those content with others. So basically everyone can exclude everyone as long as you stay within the borders that you were all in agreement on, if they were ever to agree on them. Uh, and I think that's uh, another aspect where you can see the similarities between uh, populist politicians uh, that uh, they, sh they share and they can be in agreement with one another uh, as long as they're doing it from the safe distance of sitting in their own capitals. Um, the other aspect is, of course, the liberal versus the illiberal. Uh, and I think one of the fascinating things with, with, with Hungary is, of course, that usually um, populists at least want to maintain the, the outward trappings of something that looks like liberal democracy, no matter how much they try and undermine it. But then it seems some at some point decide that they now are so self-confident that they can do what Viktor Orban did, which is to proclaim a new version of democracy, which is illiberal, which in a sense is an oxymoron. If he had said a direct democratic one, that would be something. But to say illiberal uh, democracy is in a sense to is, is very oxymoronic in a kind of conceptual sense. Uh, feel free to disagree, by the way, if, if any one of you want to want to do that. Um, but so this is also another aspect of populism that perhaps is sometimes difficult to pinpoint, which is that it's not necessarily about the laws, even though in the end it will be about the laws. It's also about all the other things that are not legally necessarily fully regulated, but are part of what we consider to be a vibrant living uh, if you will, square where different ideas can, can contend with one another. And this, of course, for instance, comes in on media concentration. That is, if you can buy up all the media outlets, then, then you know, how is it possible to have a political discourse with any kind of bandwidth? Um, but OK, so let, let's perhaps um, broaden our perspective a bit. Paolo, some of the things that we've been discussing here uh, that also Alice and, and Gabor has brought to the table, these are of course not unique. They're not unique for Hungary, they're not unique for France, they're definitely not unique for Europe. Um, can we see some kind of coordination? What, what does synchronization look like between populists? Because we can see that as well. In, they tend to want to be friends with one another, right? Do they also inspire each other? Can we see a trend where it starts in one place and then continues? It's easy often to think that what happens in the US is where it begins and then it flows across the world. But is that always really the case? Or, or do we have things that have started over on our side of the Atlantic and spread elsewhere? Well, there's a, an intrinsic logic of expansion of populism that uh, has at a certain point to meet borders. And the borders are... Uh, I think we lost you, Paolo. Gabor, did you want to say something? Maybe you um, can do that. Or Paolo, are you back? Yes. Okay, good. So if if we are talking about Orban, it's, it's a very, very uh, interesting case how he tried to to manage a kind of alliance among populists within the European Union uh, uh, even. Uh, this attempt uh, has failed uh, uh, and ended with, with the exclusion of Fidesz from the uh, European People's Party and uh, the consequent attempts uh, of Orban to somehow unite all the, uh, all the populists uh, of, of Europe, not only not only from East, Eastern and Central Europe, not only from from Poland, uh, uh, but also from France. Uh, 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 Marine Le Pen was one of one of his his possible possible uh, allies, as well as Salvini in Italy. Uh, this attempt has failed, but certainly the playbook of of Orban is wider than even, even Europe. 
So Tucker Carlson used to call Orban as, as, a, as a model case for, for Trumpism. So Orban started this kind of, of nationalistic, uh, uh, autocratic populism much, much uh, earlier than, than, than uh, Trump uh, in 2010. And uh, Trump has just followed uh, as many others uh, followed or at least having the same approach from, from uh, Erdogan to, to Putin. And here we can speak about the, the international uh, 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 consequences, relation consequences of, of that alliances. For instance, from Orban to Putin uh, in, in the war that, that the Hungarian government is, is almost the only government which, which almost openly supports Putin in this war. Thank you. Um, Paolo, you were interrupted. Would you like to, to pick up? And then I want to go to Alice. Yeah, sorry uh, for this. I guess that there was a breakdown. Uh, in any case, I was uh, just underlining the fact that there may be some uh, interaction and some support. Agab was very rightly underlining the link between Orban and Putin. Um, but this support can uh, uh, go beyond the borders only when uh, populists share the same political regime. It's not surprising that Orban is supporting Putin because as uh, we know, and uh, Gabor reminded us, uh, Hungary today is not a consolidated democracy. It's uh, uh, much uh, more similar to uh, uh, authoritarian regime. Uh, we may label it as Orban himself uh, wants to label it as an illiberal democracy, which it is an oxymoron, but it's also an analytical category which is used in the literature. So with this respect, it's not surprising that alliances go beyond borders, uh, in particular between Erdogan, between Orban, uh, uh, among uh, those non-democratic leaders, whereas it's, it stops um, when uh, you want to uh, go towards very, very solid alliances and cri international crises come up as we have seen between Salvini, Meloni, and Putin. It was not possible to push it uh, as far as uh, maybe Salvini would have wanted to push it at the beginning. Uh, you could not exceed the limits of having different types of populism. Not only do we have neo-populisms that vary within democracies, but we also have neo-populisms that vary from one regime to the other. So the alliances can only be set within uh, similar types of uh, neo-populism within uh, the same uh, type of uh, political regimes. And there uh, as well, we may find limitations. Just look at what happened in the European Parliament on a number of occasions. It's not always easy to really transform sympathy into long-lasting alliances. So clearly inspiration, yes. Inspiration uh, uh, is uh, very much a keyword to understand how Trump uh, follows Orban, how Orban uh, may follow Trump in some uh, components. But again, um, uh, the uh, alliances cannot uh, be reached if there is no uh, similar political regime. If the political regime is different, then there's no chance for the sympathy to be then transformed into structural alliances. Thank you. Uh, before I go to you, Alice, um, if you want to ask questions, this is directed to the audience, please do so. You can do that in the comment section on Facebook or in the Q&A function in Zoom. Alice, um, both Mélenchon, I believe, uh, but particularly Marine Le Pen did get some criticism because uh, she had, you know, photo ops with Putin and so on. And as you mentioned yourself, both of them are quite critical of Brussels in general uh, and, and NATO also. Um, how does the French land, political landscape, did the war in Ukraine affect it that much in the end, or was that more the expectation? Not. Uh, surprisingly, I mean, Marine Le Pen, uh, as you say, she was shaking uh, hands with uh, Putin. She printed 1.2 million leaflets ahead of the election, showing that she's a good friend of Putin. Uh, she had to throw them away and say, oh, no, this is not good, Ukraine. 
uh, in the debate with Macron, the final debate, uh, he was using the argument against her that she accepted Crim, uh, that Crim was occupied, Crimea, what did you say, maybe, uh, 2000, 2014. Um, but even that didn't really, it didn't really, uh, Ukraine did not really play into the election, actually. Um, and I think um, it's, it's, it, important in France to think of, okay, Marine Le Pen, she's a good friend of Orban, she's a very good friend of Salvini, and she's, uh, she likes to show that she's a good friend of them, she has friends, and she plays very much on a European level, she has been a parliamentary, uh, European parliament, and that has been also seen for her to actually meet the others. Um, but uh, it's important to remember Mélenchon as uh, as a, also a populist, I would say, uh, also someone who is uh, uh, giving this, uh, as I said before, overbids. I think um, you have this nationalistic, uh, strong, anti-immigration, anti-Muslims. You have Marie Le Pen, you had Simou coming up, uh, and then Mélenchon. It's important to, to actually realize that a lot of French voters now vote for very loose arguments for this um you, you talk about exclusion and inclusion but voters vote for for making just France stronger uh, and um they listen very much to that argument and Marine Le Pen is proud of saying that uh, she is a good friend of Putin and uh, she was also saying that um NATO as soon as the war is over NATO should restart uh, negotiations with Putin, which actually made Robert Menard, for example, which is famous, uh, he was the head of uh, Reporters Without Borders, for example, and his uh, mayor in South France, a profile in France, he left her actually, he, he said, I'm going to vote for Macron, this is outrageous, how can you say that you're going to start to negotiate with Putin in this situation. Uh, so, but it never really played into the election, which surprised a lot of people, actually, the, the whole situation with Ukraine. Excellent. Thank you um, for those points. Now, if we were to then uh, take the conversation to uh, look at what this means for European politics, because now we've been speaking about what it means in domestic and the bilateral, if you will, what is the hun Hungarian position on various foreign policy issues. But if we were to th think about the European Union as a union um, and see how these movements now exist in all countries, both from the left and the right in, in basically almost more countries than, than, than not, um, what will this mean for the stability uh, of union politics? Because I was thinking about what you mentioned, Paolo, about that there is a limit to how this, uh, if you will, this alliance, this sympathy. Partly, this is also about the transactional nature uh, of politics. This politics is much more based on the transactional approach rather than that this is an institutionalized structure that we're going to stick to irrespective of who is elected next time. Now, does this this could, of course, be said to increase the instability of the European Union itself. Um, does anyone want to, to have a go at that? Paolo, perhaps you would like to start. Well, uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, uh, not forget that we do have Eurosceptics within the European Parliament. We had, uh, we had them uh, for uh, at least a decade. They were uh, particularly powerful uh, in 2019 up to 30%, 35% of uh, the European Parliament can be seen as Eurosceptic, but this has not um, obliged Europe somehow to uh, uh, go back to non-European Union politics uh, in the sense that uh, institutionalizing Euroscepticism is the best way for the European Union to continue with European uh, policies, uh, somehow incorporating uh, not only skepticism, also criticism and consolidating the majority that is currently in favor of Europe with different nuances, of course. Uh, but I would say that um, uh, the a big uh, um, uh, wave uh, of Euroscepticism has reached its peak within the European Union. I would not expect it to uh, go beyond uh, the, the current uh, 30 to 35 percent, which is already is a lot. 
Uh, but as we have seen at the national level, it's very difficult in consolidated democracies. Let me underline this because we always have to differentiate the political regime, as I was saying before. But in consolidated democracies, which uh, is uh, uh, all the 25 uh, countries of the European Union, uh, with, and again, we don't see Poland, we don't, I would argue, we don't see Hungary, but all the others, uh, all the other 25 are consolidated democracies, um, to a certain extent at least. And therefore, uh, it's very difficult also at the national level to see uh, populist Eurosceptics uh, gain uh, uh, power, actually. Uh, and this is also something that we, we, we see within the European Parliament. Uh, there is a, a, a majority uh, of um, your, the European electorate, which is broadly speaking in favor of Europe. Now, the, the other point I want to make here is that we should not consider any criticism towards Europe as populist Euroscepticism. Uh, because Europe has gone along tracks over the past 10, 15 years that have been very, very painful for a number of countries. And we should never forget this, especially when we look at Southern European countries. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, inclusionary populists that have underlined the fact that, well, the European Union uh, in some policies has uh, not helped that much to overcome some crisis. So um, to, to conclude, I, I do think that Populist Euroscepticism uh, is at its peak. Um, this does not mean that Euroscepticism within the European Union may not advance, but that really much that depends very much on the policies that the European Union is going to carry out uh, in the in the in the future. Clearly, the COVID period is a period, uh, and still is currently a period where we have policies that we actually never have seen uh, at the European Union level. A massive uh, 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 um, money put into uh, the economies at the national level, and this somehow suspended uh, the overall criticism towards the European Union. We'll have to see what's going to happen in 2024. And it very much depends, uh, if we put aside the war, uh, of course, in Ukraine, it very much depends on what uh, the current uh, uh, European institutions will deliver in terms of policy proposals in the country. Good. Um Alice, before you leave, uh, I just want to uh, pop back to you, um, because what Paul is saying, I, mean, I, I think we can all agree that obviously just being skeptical or critical of the European Union does not amount to populism in and of itself. There's also the question of populism as part of popular democracy. There's, you know, to some degree, the point of democracy is that you are being very keen listener to what the population uh, is asking for. Uh, the point of a, of a Liberal democracy, of course, is not to allow the majority to just decide anything they want, but certain limits and certain rights are inalienable, so you can't vote them out. But Alice, the question here, going back to what Paolo said, is if Marine Le Pen or someone else, left or right, who is much more skeptical towards Brussels and NATO, but primarily to, towards Brussels, were to win the next presidential elections, that will have huge consequences for the European Union as a project. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for example, if things were, I mean, Hungary has been uh, in uh, a case for the European Court. I think Marine Le Pen, for example, she would not follow the things that the court would say, for example. Um, so you have situations like that, that she, was, she would say, okay, they are saying that, but I'm not going to follow it. Uh, that's not in the French people's interest. Uh, I think you have things uh, when it comes to business. Uh, uh, I think everyone was just relieved that Macron was, she did actually win this time. Uh, but as you say, we don't know for the next 2027, because France now is very divided in various small groups. And uh, um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's quite a, da sort of a dangerous, it may be a difficult word to say, but it's not, it's a very difficult situation, actually. And I think for on the European level, um, if someone like her or Mélenchon, they would actually, there would be a new Orban, a new, <laughs> new person like that, making a lot of obstacles, and France would not give enough more, uh, give us much money as it's, uh, it does today, for example. Um, there would be a lot of things like that. Not saying that the European Union, uh, which would stop it or so, uh, no. Um, there is no Frexit, I think, uh, but still it's, um, France would not be as 
important player as today. And the French German axis would be, uh, of course, that which is so important to get things moving in the European Union would not work at all. So there are a lot of different various things. I would say the court, the budget, um, how things are decided within the union among the ministers in the in the council. I th there are a lot of things that would be, be very much changed if, for example, Marine Le Pen would gain, win. Very good. I just want to thank you, Alice, because I know you have to dash off to another talk that you're giving. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution to this conversation. We hope to see you again in other constellations later Thank on. you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the other panelists and to the audience. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Um, Gabor, uh, what is you, as you said, you work on constitutional law primarily. Um, once we start dismantling some of these checks and balances that you mentioned and some of these guarantees for uh, uh, basic freedoms, um, what is the way out and to what extent does this kind of dismantling in a domestic setting, uh, how far and to what extent and how could anyone from the outside uh, help mitigate that kind of downward trend as it were? Yeah, the first, the first answer to your question is that those problems can only be solved uh, domestically. So only the, 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 the local voters can, can outvote uh, those uh, autocratic populists if they can, uh, uh, if they did not rig the election system altogether. The European Union can do a lot and I cannot, cannot criticize uh, enough the European Union being not only, only uh, uh, very, very soft towards those uh, autocratic populists, but sometimes being even, even complicit, uh, helping uh, Orban in the last 12 years, not, not really uh, using any kind of leverage, any kind of serious sanction against uh, its, its uh, uh, regime. So uh, in other words, uh, the EU is also responsible what, what has happened in, in Hungary or in Poland for that matter. But let me, let me uh, finish with, with a rather more optimistic uh, 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 kind of comment, namely that I think that the war has changed a lot of things. Uh, it, it performed uh, a, an unforeseen solidarity within the European Union with some examples, uh, with some exceptions, even with core, core EU member states like, like uh, the reluctance of Germany, uh, uh, but mostly Hungary, uh, uh, with with its its support of of Russia, but on the other hand, this almost unified kind of solidarity uh, against uh, Russia uh, made it also possible that that probably the EU will step in uh, against those countries which are autocratic populist on the one hand, but also on the other hand, very much support uh, 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 the country which started this war. So probably this, this is not by chance that, that the European Union started its first uh, uh, kind of, of sanction mechanism, conditionality mechanism against Hungary after it became clear that Hungary is on the other side uh, in the in the in the war, uh, maybe this is a coincidence, but but I cannot exclude that that most of the EU member states are fed up with this this uh, kind of not only not complying with EU values, but uh, not complying with with the with the basic uh, EU solidarity in certain issues. Let it be the refugee crisis, let it be COVID, or let it be the war in Ukraine. 
Thank you. Um, Paolo, final comments uh, as we are going to uh, start winding this down. Now, we want, of course, in the follow-up seminars that we're going to have, uh, discuss cases beyond uh, the European continent, uh, because obviously there are striking similarities and in, in, in modalities and so on that would be interesting to look like at, for instance, India, the United States, uh, Brazil, and so on. But perhaps let's bring it back to the kind of the analytical uh, scholarly dimension of this. Uh, to what, what is your view of how the study of populism is progressing uh, as a kind of a meta level to what we're actually seeing in the political practice? Clearly populism and populism research has really been uh, booming over the past years uh, simply because the political reality increasingly went into a populist direction and uh, the issue uh, regarding the definition uh, of populism or neo-populism uh, I think um, does underline uh, the analytical relevance for solid uh, uh, foundations in order to disentangle what is, uh, going back to one of your first question, what is neo-populism and what uh, uh, is not neo-populism. Uh, my take uh, on uh, the uh, current state of affairs is that actually we did enter into uh, a neo-populist zeitgeist, so to speak, uh, throughout uh, Europe, but also elsewhere. That is, that for a number of reasons, um, uh, including uh, the uh, social media innovations, uh, it's not only the fact that you have leaders that are playing uh, the uh, populist game, but you have crises, you have political crisis in democracies, you had economic crisis in a number of countries, you have cultural crisis in terms of migration and identity issues, you have social crisis in a number of countries. Well, using uh, leadership and mobilizing over the crisis, thanks also to the new social media uh, innovations is clearly uh, facilitating the spread uh, of uh, uh, populism or neo-populism. Uh, so we, we, see, we, we see mechanisms, uh, techniques uh, that are very, very similar in countries that are far away one from the other. Uh, somehow the playbook, the neo-populist playbook is becoming increasingly popular because it's very easy to follow. Once again, you do have uh, leadership capacities. Trump had these capacities, for example. Uh, but most likely Modi has these capacities as well, together with many others. Also in, in Africa, we have a number of cases that go in, in this direction. Um, analytically speaking, uh, the, the main concern, my main concern is, once again, to make sure that we have a solid empirical research that allows us uh, to, uh, first of all, uh, not condemn, uh, condemn a priori any kind of neo-populism, because that's the second step, right? The step of what is the consequence of neo-populism? In some cases, it's catastrophic. In other cases, uh, it's an answer. Uh, this is particularly true for consolidated democracies. It may be an answer to uh, questions that come from uh, the citizens that have not been addressed by other parties. So it's very easy simply to say, they're the bad guys, we are the good guys, come back to us. We political parties are the good guys. It will not work, it's very risky. Um, political parties, political institutions have to understand the roots of neo-populism, uh, especially again in democracy, but we could argue also beyond democracy because uh, the neo-populist answer is the easy way out to a context where it's so difficult to find certainties. And again, going back to basic human needs, you want uh, to have some degrees of certainty you don't want to be flexible all your life because your job is going to be taken away in six months time by uh, you do not know who, uh, and you're going to be uncertain for the decades to come. Uh, that's why Le Pen is so successful. That's why other populists are so successful because they're providing some uh, security. First of all, psychological security, not only uh, physical security. So uh, to, to wrap it up, it's, it's expanding and the research is expanding. Um, too often, well, not too often, but sometimes we see uh, research which is too much guided by normative goals. Uh, again, we, it's not to deny the fact that in Hungary, the situation is tragic for democracy. On the contrary, it's to make the argument even more powerful. 
because you can say there, there are some circumstances where neo-populism is reinvigorating democracy. And in other cases, it's killing democracy. But the more precise you are in making clear what are the conditions under which neo-populism is killing democracy, the more effective you can also be from a normative perspective. Thank you very much. Very important points to make. I don't want to start off a new conversation right now uh, and don't want to create a dichotomy. But I think perhaps also when we're talking about social media, we're talking about emotions. We're talking about emotive politics, which of course is a very quick way of mobilizing people. But that's for the next webinar, perhaps. I just want to thank now both of you uh, for your participation and for helping us, I hope, nuance and make things not more complex, but to show the complexity uh, of the concept and that it is definitely not as easy as saying that if you go with us, it's good. And if you go with them, it's bad or that it is something that by definition can only go wrong. Uh, these are things that, that have to be put in their proper context, case by case as well. So thank you very much to, to Paolo and to Gabor for your participation. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, later on again in conversations about this topic. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you very much.